Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar. My name is Felix Balderas and I'll be presenting today's topic, a self-organizing map primer, unsupervised neural nets demystified. I intend this to be a non-technical presentation of how you could use neural networks in the process of seismic attribute analysis. I intend to present why you may want to use neural networks and I'm going to describe the process of, of how I'm going to use color classification to simulate seismic attribute values for the purposes of visualization. I'm going to describe what a self-organizing map is. Sometimes I call that a SOM. And I'm going to describe a neuron and discuss the SOM algorithms. And at the end, I'm going to illustrate all this process with an animation. Why would you want to use neural networks? Well, they can be a very fast and powerful technique, which can be used and in fact is used to solve many world problems in our industry. For instance, they are used for seismic, classes, uh, seismic facies classification, litho facies classification. Neural networks have the ability to learn from their experience. As more and more data is presented to it, they learn about the data. In addition, they are able to deal with incomplete information or noisy data. For instance, in our industry, they're used to complete well log data where some portion of it is missing. They'll use the other well logs to train the neural network into learning what type of data should be there. So they can be used in uh, very complex situations where there isn't uh, a way to define certain rules to program. When we talk about neural networks, we talk about their learning methods, their topology, and the applications that they could be used in. And they fall into two broad categories, supervised and unsupervised. Whereas the supervised category, you know the answer ahead of time and you use that to train the network. Your purpose is to find the relationships between the input data and the output responses. There are many types of supervised neural networks. I've listed only a few. Uh, but at the, end, I, uh, at the end of this presentation, I will present some resources where you can find a lot more information about supervised neural networks. Their application is, is uh, usually for prediction of some certain outcome. But what we're discussing today is unsupervised neural networks. This is where, and you would use this, where the answer is not known. Your goal is to find structures or patterns in the data the topology is referred to self-organized. There are various types of self-organized, uh, unsupervised vector quantizer, quantizer being one of those, but we are interested in the Kokonan self-organizing maps, which use competitive and cooperative training, and we're going to discuss what that means. And the purpose of, why would, of using this would be for classification and clustering of data so it gives you a picture of the type of data that you're dealing with. Now I'm going to use color classification to help visualize seismic data. So first I'm going to have to normalize that, seism that seismic data into the RGB, red, blue, or red green, blue uh, color range. I'm going to do this because color classification is, is easier to grasp. We can use a small amount of data. There are only three attributes, red, green, and blue. And we can ignore one of the colors and just use red and green for even more simplicity. So here's the process. I'm going to find the min and max values of a trace range or maybe a volume range. But I've got two, two seismic attribute volumes, amplitude and coherency. And I know that they're minimum value and their maximum value. And so, for example, the amplitude minimum value is actually 44. And I show... 144 down here, uh, but it's actually 44, uh, negative 44. I'm going to assign that negative 44 to the, the uh, smallest red value, which is 0. And then I'm going to assign the maximum value, 34, to its um, maximum red uh, color, which is 255. And then for coherency, I, I notice that its minimum value is negative 128, so I'll assign that to green of 0, and then the maximum value of 127, I'll assign that to the green. Uh, that'll normalize the amplitude ranges to the color values. And I'm going to ignore the color blue. 
now that I've normalized the data values, I'm going to take a trace from each of the amplitudes and over a certain range of, of data. I'm going to tabularize those, put them in two columns side by side, and I'm going to cross plot those. But those values have now been normalized to red and green colors. So in this cross plot that I have, on the y-axis I'm showing a coherency as associated with green. And on the bottom, on the x-axis, I've got the amplitude values now associated, or that is normalized to red. And where that green-red pair match, uh, that is a data point. And when those values are zero, uh, low green, low red, uh, the color is black. When, it's, uh, when the pair has mostly a green component, it's, it goes to the top left. When it has mostly a red component, to the top right. And when it has an equal component of red and green, which is actually coherency and amplitude, then we see that in the orange at the, at the, uh, at the top right. Now, I'm going to use the neural network to classify those data points that we saw in the cross plot. What, you, what I'm showing below is the grid where, with 16 squares, where each square is called a node. The nodes will organize the colors in the cross plot. Now, the, the user decides how many nodes he wants to use. I've chosen 16 for this demonstration. There may be many more colors than there are 16 nodes, but all those colors uh, have to fit in, into only 16 nodes, so you take the ones that fit the closest. If it's not exactly orange, well, then maybe that's close enough for the 16. It has to be for the 16 uh, colors. You may want to choose more, uh, more nodes. So for instance, in this slide I'm showing another square that has 64. Now both of these uh, illustrate in different level of details the same colors that were in the cross plot. This, this technique allows us to visualize multi-dimensional data in fewer dimensions. So for instance, we're not talking about red and green, we're not talking about the red and green together uh, that, make, make, that makes up uh, a, a input vector into the neural network. We're talking about one single color, the color orange now. Okay, so that allows us not to talk about two dimensions as if it were just one, right? And two, instead of talking about red and green, we're talking about orange. So this technique is, a, is known as classification and is a technique that's often used for, in data compression. Now, each node in the SOM is mapped to a neuron in the neural network. In fact, each node in the SOM, each one of these squares, is actually just a representation of the node in the neural network. It's really just another way of looking at it. Uh, and because a neural network, a, I'm sorry, a neuron in a neural network is a data object that contains variables. These are called weights. And there are as many weights in the neuron as there are attributes. So in our case, two attributes, right? Coherency, amplitude, now, now red and green. Uh, so we have a dimensionality of two. Every data point is presented to every neuron repeatedly. And this is done n number of times. With each repetition, the neurons in the self-organizing map attempt to become more like the data that is presented to them. So for instance, where these neurons initially started out as blue, as data is presented to them, some start changing color. They start changing color, so they become more orange-like, more red-like, more green-like. When the neuron receives the data, its weights are adjusted with data values. This is called training. Now, before training, the neuron contains some random weights. For instance, this one here is a color of blue. So it's weights, the two colors that make up this, the, uh, uh, that are in, the, the, the two values that are in, in the weights for this neuron make up the color blue. And now the orange dot has some component of red and green. And during the training, the neuron is adjusted to the red and green based on the learning parameter. Now you could say that there was no blue in, in the original two colors, so we could say there was some shade of purple or something like that that has some more uh, red, uh, red and green, maybe some shade of orange, I should say. 
but during the training, the neuron is adjusted to the red and green based on a learning parameter. Uh, that is, the learning parameter is set by the user. Now, after training, the neuron will more closely resemble the orange dot. So in this case here, it was one color, and now it's a maroonish color. Uh, the uh, learning parameters, uh, or sometimes called learning controls, will determine how much to adjust. Adjusting too much, that is adjusting some of the learning controls in one direction or the other, could cause the neuron to not learn about the other data points. So it just learns about the orange, it quickly slides over to the orange, and it doesn't learn about the other colors. Adjusting too little will cause the neurons to not learn enough about the data points. So you may not ever get there, and you'll never have any data associated with a neuron. Now all the neurons are trained are with all the data several times. Each time all the data is input to the neurons is called an epoch. The neurons adjust a little more each epoch, and this is called learning. Now the amount of movement, the amount of learning, is based on those learning parameters, those learning controls, which the user uh, sets up. And the user also sets up how many epochs, that is how many times, that the data will be presented to the neurons. Each time the neurons look and look a little bit more like the data that was presented to it. But Cohen also has the characteristic that neurons not only adjust themselves to the data, but they adjust the neighboring neurons as well. And this is called cooperative learning. The neuron closest to the data point, which is presented, is considered the winning neuron. So here comes the data point presented to all the neurons. The neuron which most closely resembles the data point is the winning neuron. It, now it gets to move the most toward the data point. It was already the closest, now it's moving even closer. But it's also going to pull the, its neighboring neurons toward that same point, but to a lesser degree. So here I'm illustrating an orange neuron that already looks like it, the orange dot. It's the win, so it becomes the winner and it moves strongly in that direction. It will also pull any neighbors around it in that same direction, but not as strongly. So, in these squares below, I'm showing uh, for uh, an example of number if neuron number 36 was presented an orange dot, it turns even oranger, and it, and it also then turns causes the its neighbors to become another uh, a closer shade of orange. Combined with what other colors was already there, so you'll see that some are kind of yellowish or, uh, or kind of um, brownish because it doesn't turn directly into orange but rather some color close to it. But next, here comes another data point in this second square, a magenta color. And for instance, number 51, um, neuron may be the closest to magenta uh, perhaps and so it gets, it's, becomes the winner and it, it adjusts its neighbors as well. So we call that, uh, and how much does adjust, that, that is the amount of influence that it, that it has on, in, on adjusting its neighbors, is called the neighborhood radius. Now, and here in the third square, we've presented a blue uh, data point. And um, in this case, I'm using uh, three colors, by the way, for this particular <laughs> illustration. So it does have blue. but it shows that the neuron is adjusting its neighbors within some radius. Even the ones that were previously magenta before now have a color that's more bluish in nature.